Hello everyone, this is Olympia Mesha speaking and uh, you're welcome to join me today for the second edition of the Think Like talk show uh, made and created and prepared for you by How People Learn Book Project. Today we have a special guest, but before that, uh, let me just remind you that this project uh, will have a different name every time. So don't be surprised in terms of what goes behind the think like. And today we have an author with us uh, and also uh, a person that does a lot of other stuff, but today we will dive deep and asking questions in terms of how and um, what exactly an author does things and how he thinks. It's um, an international award-winning author uh, also, uh, somebody who is a dear friend of mine because, and I wanted him to be one of my first guests because we had this talk before I published the book, How People Learn, and he helped a lot in finding the project team I needed at that moment in time, one year ago. So before we go into that, why a different name? Think like an author for today, but maybe tomorrow we will have a doctor and uh, the show will be Think Like a Doctor. Uh, if uh, in one week we will meet uh, the UNESCO chair of York University, maybe we could name that special edition Think Like a President, even if uh, he's not a president, but a very uh, good mentor for me. And what I've learned from uh, this particular person is how to think big, long term, and look at the big picture and the big problems of the uh, um, uh, planet. So this is a project based on the research I do for a new book series with the same name for children, but also parents and adults, because I believe, uh, and all of the people in this uh, project believe that uh, we are all lifelong learners. Welcome, welcome, Stephen. Uh, Stephen de Souza is our new guest for uh, this edition. Uh, Stephen, how are you? Are you online with me? I am. Uh, thank you, Olympia. Welcome again. So I know you work with leaders and you help them uh, probably not only develop for their business skills, but also, for, um, and I don't know, maybe think about themselves like lifelong learners. Uh, why do leaders need to learn continuously? Is this really necessary? Yeah, it's a good question. I always start when I, uh, let's say I teach with a quote from Hoffa. And it says something along the lines that the, learn, uh, the learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with an earth that no longer exists. And the way I describe it is knowledge is a commodity that quickly becomes outdated and your ability to keep on learning, refreshing your skills is a lifelong uh, attribute and capability. So that's the way I frame it with executives, but also with, in my own life as well. Good, and you are also an author. Uh, for me, it's for um, four books. Maybe there's more, so you will correct me. My favorite and the one I read in English is Not Knowing. Uh, also, I bought a Romanian version and I gave it as a gift to my sister because she's, uh, she was reading in Romania. I think uh, if I'm, this was quite, a, uh, quite some time ago. Uh, what, can you tell me about the other books or maybe start with this one? Yeah, so maybe I can say what I started, which is the first book, and it was called Made in Britain, and it was about positive role models from diverse uh, minority communities in Britain. And it was sponsored free for schools uh, in England because uh, in the media there was an outcry, there's a lack of positive role models, particularly for young people from minority communities, specifically young black boys, for example, they could see entertainers or they could see sports personalities, but not often would they see CEOs or people running companies as role models. So for myself, I'd never done any writing before in terms of professionally. I'd studied a very different subject at university, but I thought I know people who are inspiring from many different communities, just their story is not being told. So I set about writing this book, really collecting stories of people from diverse professions, from a rocket scientist, to a hat maker, to a delivery van driver, to a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize building architect, to an entrepreneur. 
And um, that book really, I conjunct it with a video and also with teaching resources that somebody could go into a school, could deliver a, a video and a lesson, but also they could speak to live role models to understand not just where somebody is now, but what are the steps that they took to get there and revealing themselves, not as perfect human beings, but warts and all. You know, well, how do they think of their identity? How do they relate to failures, which are inevitable path to success? So this was the, the first oh, book. Wow, how me. many years ago was this? Um, it was 15, nearly 16 years ago. So uh, it was Can we a... revive? Can you re we revive the project somehow? Because I have, well, I get, we are getting lots of questions from children, parents and schools these days yeah. because of the pandemic. <laughs> it's funny, but I, you know, I shared that project at the time with other friends and I had one friend, he, he set up a similar book for Singapore. So he interviewed uh, role models in Singapore and made a, an equivalent made in Singapore. So I think it's an easy way to, to capture interest, to make it shareable. But I think the beauty of it was telling real person stories. So not just people you read, like often when you read a book, you hear examples like uh, Steve Jobs or an entrepreneur that's distant and removed. But when you read about people in your local community or you read about people in your country, it's a very different feeling. And yeah. also making that as part of a resource, not just the book on itself, but connecting with individuals, connecting with multimedia, I think helps support that learning and helps people see uh, what's possible. Yeah, so in here, in this room and project, we want to know, uh, we want to network. So tell me about the other books. Yeah, the networking one, it came by accident. Like I'd written Made in Britain, and I wanted to do a second book just to prove it wasn't luck that the first book happened. <laughs> I suggested a book on psychology, on this topic. On, but they said, no. They said, Stephen, could you write a book on networking? And it wouldn't have been something I'd naturally um, do. But it turned out to be the perfect book for me because I've always enjoyed connecting with people. And in particular, connecting with different people. So the value of diversity. So it's not just the quantity but it's the difference in your network that I think brings original ideas and brings that. So that book did very well and it went to something like 13 different languages and really helped really shape what do I uh, teach. But I thought it was a natural expression as well of what's my philosophy regarding learning and regarding growth. And growth and learning comes from not when similarity, but walking towards difference and then looking at what can I learn from that from that difference and I think well, then, like then, then I will interrupt you right now and we will continue about the other books after our audience gets to know you better and uh, they will immediately figure out why people around you thought you are the perfect guy for the networking book would you like to do a test at like a quiz with me sure okay so this is a quiz to get to know you in 30 seconds because we have only we've got only 40 40 minutes for this show mm -hmm. and uh i'll ask you questions like uh with the, for which i need a a or b uh, answer like you have to choose between uh, two or three options mm -hmm. but very quick even if you want to explain because you feel awkward like giving a, a certain answer you, you can do yeah. that only at the end okay you do not stop i know this is a little bit like in school but we exact that's exactly why we do this and uh, on the at the beginning of the show sure. so just laugh about it and enjoy quizzes so you're ready yeah okay friend. okay good the moon or the sun the moon wine or chocolate wine Boxing or motorcycling? Boxing. Bananas or oranges? Bananas. Maramuresh or Gdansk? Maramuresh. Uh -huh. Printed books or audiobooks? Uh, printed. Student or learner? Learner. Knowing, doing or being? Being. Inspiration or perspiration? <laughs> Inspiration. <laughs> Education system or education world, and then you can think edu uh, business system or business world. Um, business system, business world. Okay, good. Thank you, Stephen. Now you can explain um, why Maramuresh, for example. 
<laughs> so as you know, Olympia, I lived in Romania for around two years and I've always had a love affair with Romania in the sense that if I think about a country that produces inspiring people, entrepreneurial people and a, a beautiful land, it has to be Romania. And I'd read a, a book um, a while ago. It was called Along the Enchanted Way. And it was, uh, it was written by somebody who was describing village life in, uh, in Marumaresh. And I fell in love with uh, the book and I needed to go and see the villages. So I decided to, to do that. So I actually went to Marumaresh. I went to Cluj, took, I think it was like a three hour bus to Breb. And I stayed in a monastery near Basana. And uh, I really enjoyed the, the village life. There was a festival of the villages there, I think organized by a local organizer. But just seeing the culture, seeing the wooden churches and understanding something of that context was really enriching to me. And uh, I still have happy memories of that, uh, as well as the Horinka de Marimara. <laughs> I, I haven't thought we'll talk about love affairs in this talk show, but I think that's good for uh, educators around the world to do. <laughs> They think you saw go back to your books. Now we understand why people around the world uh, probably or your friends thought you were very good at networking. I'll look into that book too. And if those watching us today want to see some pictures with you in Marmoresh, I advise them to go onto your Facebook page, maybe send a like or a, uh, a friends invite to be able to see those beautiful pictures. And uh, going back to your book, so how did you continue? How did you switch to not knowing? Yeah, so I think uh, the networking book was quite uh, practical and, you know, it was a business book. So I think I wrote maybe 50 something thousand words and they took away 15. They said, Stephen, we want the bullet, book, bullet point book. There are no stories, no metaphors, just for the busy executive. And for me, although that was, it was like, a, okay, I can add the stories if I teach and if I speak, but for some reason, it wasn't touching on something deeper and I wanted to convey something deeper in my work. And I remember one day walking in a tube station, a metro in, in London and thinking, what do I write about that is meaningful? And I didn't know. And then it hit me. It's my own not knowing. And that wasn't the same as uncertainty it was this state of not being sure and at the time I was uh, my therapist said to me Stephen you always seem to make hard decisions for yourself don't you you polarize things so you say should I do this or should I do that yet it doesn't need to be that way so I became curious about people who relate to the unknown not as a space of uncertainty but as a place or a space of opportunity and developing a different relationship to the unknown and the beauty of this book for me was combining my passions, so combining philosophy, spirituality, psychology, but also with the world of leadership and management, sort of making a bridge between interdisciplines. And I think that's where the, the real joy comes. So often when we read uh, books or academic books as, as such, they tend to be quite dry. And I wanted to introduce poetry, for example. So we have a lot of poet poems from Rilke, from David White, uh, the management uh, work uh, poet. I also wanted to make sure it's not just using words but using space. So we hired our uh, own designers. Actually my co-author to mention is Diana Renner who I credit a hundred percent with the book. Uh, she's the voice and she's the, the the beauty eloquency of her own stories listening to Radio Free Europe at the time and combining it uh, was the importance there. But we used illustrated to make the book, book an ex aesthetic experience it's not just words i think that's important to get across as well and i don't uh, remember you mentioning boxing was there anything about that um boxing is a personal thing of mine <laughs> so uh, with lockdown i'm sure many of us responded differently but for a while before i wanted to do something physical to be in my body because i think much of the value is somatic rather than and particularly as a a writer, I don't consider that my full-time work, but as a writing or sitting at a desk, part of it's getting physical. And I think boxing is an art form as well. So you have to think, yeah. call it um, questioning and answering and developing different questions. So it's quite an interesting sport and I do enjoy it. It's certainly taxing and it gets you fit and healthy, but it's a great lot of fun as well. Yeah, I'm sure there is definitely a connection 
in uh, you know in this metaphor boxing and for example your uh, favorite thing that you just chose a being probably it's connecting not to the not knowing book but to the uh, not being part <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so the not knowing was trying to offer something alternative because uh, in education and many of the people listening will be in the world of education we tend to privilege the known and yet most of their possibility comes from what we don't know at least this open mind and this curious curiosity which we tend to undervalue. That's why I chose the moon as well. So the moon is often a symbol of the unconscious rather than the conscious. And one of the metaphors that we use in not knowing, actually the cover is darkness shining in the light. And it comes from beyond the analyst who says, darkness illuminates, meaning that all growth, all transformation generally happens in the dark. So you think about the baby in the womb, think about the seed in the earth, when you think that nothing is happening in your life, that's often a period of transformation after gestation. So to consider that, and that for me, the moon is a symbol of that. And what, it's obviously a case of both. Like I value knowledge, but it's always a case of balancing it. So it's balancing our knowing with our unknowing, balancing our conscious with the unconscious elements and to give a more rounded view. In the same way, I wrote a book called Not Doing, which was we tend to emphasize action and activity but how can we also see uh, the value of working with the context and not always striving and not always pushing and not being takes that to another level in that we're always taught from a young age, we need to become, and we're always taught to always to develop ourselves and be better, be more, but the consequences of this almost like ego development all the time can have uh, unintended consequences. And that's when we see things, the rise of populism, but we see constant dissatisfaction. We see maybe depression, loneliness. So the idea here is to reconceive of this idea of you need to develop this and protect and defend this idea of who you are to questioning who exactly are you and being able to have a wider identity that's intimately connected to all of life or to other people intrinsically. So that's what I'm uh, thinking about now in the, in the new book. I, I can see them all together like a Venn diagram, but in three, we, you know, connecting with each other. So, but I'm very curious, what if you had to, you had the opportunity to teach all three books, like in a form of a course mm. at one of the major um, educational centers that you already teach or you did in the past? Which one would you choose to start with? And then which one to continue with? Is it gonna be the same order as the chronological order or you'll choose yeah. a different way? I, I think so. Like I have taught not knowing at different universities like Oxford with executives and in Asia and different countries. And I think that's a ground because often we start with thinking we know and it's about opening up that fertile ground of not knowing. So in the book, we have one of our favorite quotes from Suzuki Zen Roshi. In the beginner's mind are many, uh, oh, sorry, in the beginner's mind are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. So by brilliant starting- book, with, Brilliant book. It's very hard to find it online, but uh, if you have the chance, I'm speaking now to our audience, uh, uh, grab this book. Yeah, so I think that's that's what I would start with. And I think he has to maybe start with then the knowing, open up that space for possibility, then look at overactivity. And then finally, I think being is the, is the core or the not being and uh, starting, ending with that. So I think it worked out naturally. When Diana, my co-author, she, uh, she's from Cryova, when we started, I don't think we originally conceived of a trilogy, but it seemed to follow because... We tend to think about what do leaders um, be doing have, but what you know, do learners and what do we need to be thinking about being, doing and knowing as well, know, do, be. Mm -hmm. It fits in very well with, with that world. How many people do you have in an audience usually uh, at a business school where you teach? Uh, it varies an enormously. Some uh, events I've spoken to. Give me the biggest number because that's a challenge. Yeah, maybe 2,000 people. Okay, some. so imagine, imagine you have a, a room uh, with 2,000 children, uh, 12 years old. Uh, what would you like to teach or you think uh, you could teach them? Yeah, I'd be very suspicious if I thought I could teach anything to 2,000 children. It would be more me trying to hope to keep attention or have something of interest for them 
uh, to offer, um, but what would I teach? I think uh, I wouldn't necessarily try to impart, it depends what they've asked me to talk about, but I would try to keep the words as short as possible. And I try to do activities uh, that convey something and then ask, what did you think about this? So doing it inductively rather than deductively. Mm -hmm. So before, uh, before we went live, we were talking about some the previous uh, show mm -hmm. where your son was speaking with a, a learner and they were doing exercises. So equally, when I'm teaching for exec executives, for example, I might get them out of their head and doing something in the actual room. So for example, let's say they're struggling with uh, nervousness or they're struggling with anxiousness. They're not sure how to increase their presence. I would get them to stand up. Um, we can do it now, Olympia, if you wish. Yeah, let's do if it. You can, it. Just, uh, if you can, that's. And then I'd get them to use their body, just extend their hands to the left and to the right as just, far just as possible. Just to show that I'm doing this. I'll, I'll yeah, see. so you want to keep it to, uh, to the east and to the west. And imagine your hands extending all the way. Now keep your head up. But I want you to keep this breath and this space and just slowly lower your hands, but keep the width. And you'll notice that what you do is you settle into a much more open and expansive uh, body posture. Then let's imagine I came like this with my shoulders. Yes, I do. Head. It's very difficult now to stay, uh, stand like yeah, this. <laughs> most of us are like this, right? Because we're over a keyboard or uh, we're hunched. We're maybe on the reading on the couch. But taking that posture, and I've just had people experiment. So I might experiment with lightness, for example. If they're too serious, I invite them maybe to experiment with the body of flexibility or they are struggling with keeping control. So it might experiment with an archetype of a monarch, for example. So it's a, a different way of learning. So I think to go back to your question with, with young children or with a, a group of, I would do an activity, they'd make it fun, and then have the learning emerge as a result of that, rather than try to teach uh, formally anything. I'm sure you'll be very successful doing that with children. How about leaders and executives? How do they react to this kind of, uh, you know, crazy or unusual exercises in the classroom? So I think it, uh, they react well because uh, part of it is the framing, you know, how you describe something. But also it's surprising how many people want to play again and how many want to, to learn in a different way. So one of my colleagues, for example, he's also Romanian. Uh, he's, uh, he's a professor of entrepreneurship in Madrid. Uh, he's worked with executives and including with my executives. And he'll maybe get them playing with Lego, for example, assembling something without seeing what the object is. One team has something built mm -hmm. and uh, they have to describe to another team behind a, a board. They can't see how to build something, but they're not able to dis you know, disclose fully or they might have to solve other puzzles, or they might have names on post-it notes on their head and they have to ask questions. But they're using different thinking styles, for example. That might be in experimenting whether they're an incremental thinker or they're playful or breakaway or transformative. But they're a huge feedback because they're not learning by just sitting and, you know, the old osmosis or hoping to get something, but by doing something. So I think there's a, a lack of, uh, an increased lack of attention span. People want to engage in their learning. They don't want to be passive recipients, but it's how do you frame something so that there's an ability to take an experience, but translate it across to context. So it's not just um, taking you away from co cooking and it's team building, and that may have no translation back into how do we exactly. relate to the team when we go back because norms haven't been described, et cetera. So it's getting that right combination about experience, but also giving enough bridge building to how do you put it into practice? Exactly. So because in this show, we try to uh, give the opportunity to those listening and watching us to also learn and contribute. My invitation to the audience is to try answer some of the questions I had for you uh, up until now and some of the questions I might have uh, from now on until we end the, uh, this edition. 
So try please answer the same question as the uh, guest in our show. Let's see what kind of answers we get uh, from the many of you watching right now. And you can also come up with questions for Stephen. I'll go through them and see how many we can cover today. Uh, and at the end of the show, maybe tomorrow night after uh, Stephen has a break, if you can go through the comments, Stephen, and choose the best answer, uh, somebody who answered maybe um, I don't know, in a, in a more different and surprising way than you did. And we will have a prize for this person and also for the best question. Uh, we believe in lifelong learning. Uh, and that's why uh, my question was to, uh, to, about the leaders, Stephen, was to see how open uh, do you think they are to continuously come and learn. So do you see that this is something they have to do? Do they come because there is a need? Uh, do they come to these uh, courses or to every day and every hour when they enter the room? I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure they are tired probably uh, because of many other things they have to do. Uh, what gets them motivated? Because we get this question about children a lot from educators and parents. Uh, but I think the same thing happens to adults. So what gets them motivated to come back to your educational centers? Yeah, so I think because uh, I teach in, in company or learning is delivered in, in various ways and in various formats. But what I think is the central thing that keeps them engaged is this whole idea of disruption and that uh, you can't continue to do what you were doing because of that disruption. To give you an example, I would work with a, a newspaper company, but entirely disrupted uh, with the digital model so that people were not buying physical newspapers, but going online. Mm. So they had to learn how to do things differently to not only become better prepared, but to make the business survive. So uh, a large part of the, the way that executives and what drives them to learn is to, to stay relevant but also to that their business uh, changes and disruption requires it. So they won't be around in five, 10 years unless they continue learning. So many companies are moving from business to business to business to consumer. They're moving from hierarchical structures, which were very traditional where work used to be done or based on the knowledge of somebody more senior to you to working in an unpredictable way. So much more agile teams, for example, and that requires a whole different mindset and a different skill set. So the biggest incentive, I think, is the, the changing nature of uh, the business demands on, on companies that impacts on the executives themselves for them to stay uh, relevant and to keep the company and serving their customers. I think you just gave a brilliant idea of how to teach in, um, you know, in the educational environment in schools. Like, let's, let's solve this. Uh, very destructive <laughs> problem, a bridge fall down. How do we get into solving the problem? And we have, here's the project details. Let's read about it and find out a solution. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. Imagine, yeah. imagine this was one of the uh, main words on the walls in a, in a school, like mm. uh, disruption and be prepared for it. Uh, Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think at TEDx, when I spoke last in Bucharest, there was a speaker. I can't remember the name, but Nadia, I think was her name. You, you might know her, Olympia, but she did a TEDx talk on the Titanic syndrome and this oh. idea of uh, disruption and not thinking we can just continue playing while the ship is going down. And how do we disrupt ourselves? You know, there's an author called Whitney Johnson who wrote Disrupt Yourself. Mm -hmm. So how can we start to do that for our own uh, purposes very early, almost reinventing ourselves continuously? And I think that's the, the, the need for executives now. It's almost like this constant uh, upskilling and reinventing yourself. I'll give you an example. One of my colleagues works in talent management as a very senior role, but she saw that the world is shifting away from talent and just uh, looking at identifying and developing talent but to looking at well-being and the whole field of well-being and resilience, but starting not just to, to notice those signals in the environment, but starting to upskill herself, starting to read around that, starting to learn, starting to read the journals, maybe training uh, herself in CBT, for example. But then when that shifts, she's noticed, she's prepared to actually function in a new world and leading uh, the strategy for the company in, in this new area. 
So it's noticing what is it, what is it called for in the environment and how can you prepare yourself and uh, respond and adapt to that rather than thinking I can only do the same thing because I've always done this and this is my uh, my comfort. So I do think we're in this era where we're going to shift our roles and shift. Uh, where if we're not doing portfolio careers now, we're definitely going to be having what Linda Gratton called serial uh, careers, where we're going to be experts in one thing for two or three years and then having to master something else and find parallel uh, connections. I think these models and uh, careers are changing and young people, they have to learn the skills as well to do the same. It's like you, one day you are an author, the other day you have a different role and you yes. have to prepare for each of them. Uh, yes, I can't say. I'm, I was listening actually to a, a new book by one of my friends, Christian Bush. He, he's the co-director of Innovation Lab at the London School of Economics. And he wrote a book called The Serendipity Mindset. And that literally it's just come out this uh, September. But he talks about how we don't necessarily can predict the future, but we can prepare and there's this ways that you can prepare for and look at the signals and uh, seek to have, develop those skills so you're ready to to take on new opportunities. So yes, I, I can't say I've done a career by design, um, but responding and following a thread. And when we look back, you know, as Kaibab, we can see the patterns that we may not be able to see if we were just looking forward. So I think there's something there. And I remember when I was interviewing for the first book, I interviewed this woman Angela Marr, she was the first female black uh, comedian and she was also a radio host in the UK. And uh, she said to me, Stephen, nothing, and I mean nothing, needs to be done before you're 30. And I said, what? She said, no. <laughs> At this, you're taught when you're 14, you have to choose the right options for GCSEs or your career will be over. For, you have to get the right A-levels or you can't get into the right degree. She said, nothing needs to be done. It's about experimenting, learning, getting good breath, and for me, I think it's not about 30. It's, you know, this is a lifelong thing. But I think there's a great value in when you're at school or when you're in college about uh, broadening your range and uh, broadening the kind of uh, experiences, knowledge, learning opportunities you're exposed to, because it does strengthen you, that you are able to make connections and you're able to be more of a bridge and I think those are the kind of skills, I think neo-generalist or T-shaped skills that will be needed more in the future rather than um, those who have only a deep specialism but cannot see, uh, be able to respond to the broad changes in society. Well, definitely found out how an author thinks today and also somebody who's an, uh, an experienced educator. Uh, but just in case we do not that's why we have a three part in our show. And the third part has some special questions that are from a, a set of cards uh, designed for children. Uh, it's the How People Learn game. And I've prepared, I've chose three for you. I hope we have time for at least two of them. Mm -hmm. And if you're ready, this is uh, bringing out the brilliance out of you through the question. Uh, and the first question is, uh, what is uh, what is one thing you wish you could change about the world? Uh, it, it, it's a very easy question. It's for kids, Stephen. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not an easy question. Um, about the world? Yeah. Um, I'd have it be uh, different each time I wake up in the morning. So that um, the world is a static thing, but every time I wake up and I come out of my bed, I see a different world. That's what I would change. So I think uh, we get used to thinking uh, every day is going to be like tomorrow, more of the same. And actually the reality is it's not. But so one thing, I'd, it's not really the world, but it's my attitude and response to the world. So to see it afresh every day and to see it anew. So one thing I would, if I had a magic wand and one thing I could change about it, every day will be different. And that is the re actual reality. It's not the Groundhog Day, but the experience of that would be something I would change. And then I have another question, uh, which is very simple on my card, but I will complicate it a little bit for you because mm -hmm. you're not a child anymore. So imagine you talk to yourself uh, when you are 12 years old and you, ask, you have to explain to the other you who is a, a child 
uh, what makes you intelligent? Yeah, I'd say it has very little to do with writing, ironically. And uh, I'll give you an example. Like uh, I remember at school, I really loved art and I loved painting. And I remember doing a painting of a really colorful dinosaur or two people on a bridge. It's quite a dramatic scene. And I remember having to choose at 14 what subjects to do for GCSEs and I dropped art. Um, and I remember thinking why, because it wasn't valued. It wasn't seen as a, as a subject that would get me, you know, uh, to an A level or something, it was seen as a fun subject. And now I look back at my 12 year old and I think if I had that chance, I would say education isn't about uh, just words, isn't about their head, it's about their hands, it's about their aesthetics, it's about the expression, it's about their creativity, it's about their imagination. And uh, I would do that art, <laughs> the art GCC or even that art degree. So it's this uh, valuing and uh, learning and valuing education much more broader and questioning what, what it really is. And so, you know, for example, I think in Australia, they've banned funding for subjects that aren't STEM. So if it's not science, technology, dear maths, it doesn't get, and I think it's a disgrace because I think the world is, as we discovered in COVID times, it's made bearable, it's made beautiful uh, by our artists, by our musicians, by our create, by the, the creativity that resides in all of us. So that's why I would tell our 12 year old, tell him to keep on painting, keep on drawing, and uh, to value this as much as we value other subjects. We are recording this and we are going to use this quote for parents. That's beautiful, thank you. And the last question, is if your brain could have any one magical power, what would you pick? This is the uh, favorite part actually in schools, if you can imagine. One, okay, maybe uh, to forget. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a great value in, uh, in this. I talked about freshness and not knowing is about freshness and I think we hold on and I hold on to the past or thinking and then maybe stopping sleeping deeply. But there's a, there's a value in forget, uh, forgetting. There's a value in, in having that freshness for each moment, each day, uh, rather than believing our story, you know, how this, this is how it is and uh, this is how people will respond and this is how my day will go or this is how, what's possible. And in organizationals, they call it organizational memory. And it can be a, a great immune system towards change and towards doing things differently. So I'm talking about selective forgetfulness, not just amnesia. <laughs> but I think that, that power to be able to, to forget and to uh, deliberately forget and to move on. And I think that's the, it's a real superpower. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. And this is not a question, but uh, an invite. What if, what if one day... I need a partner to uh, do a webinar for children. What would be the, uh, th this is just a, an hypothesis, what would be the theme that you would choose to facilitate together with me for children? Mm. Is, is it arts or we are going back to business? Maybe teaching them how to be entrepreneurs? I don't know. Yeah, so I, I don't think, I would never teach something directly, I think. So, you know, um, I was having a discussion today with one of my colleagues uh, heads life sciences for a large company and uh, he was telling me uh, about a company and it was called DSM and it was a, it's a Dutch and it was a former mining company but now they make uh, f nutrition for food nothing to do with what they were originally set up for and he says they didn't plan to to do that it came through natural growth and through all things so I do believe in the power of obliquity and this idea that if you pursue a goal directly, you're less likely to achieve it than if you have yeah, as an oblique result of what you do. So when I, if I uh, teach uh, a seminar, what I would do to teach is this, these skills that we've been discussing at freedom, curiosity, playfulness, this openness to serendipity, uh, developing this confidence to trust themselves but to teach it in, in an oblique way rather than in a direct way. So we mustn't make a rule. This is how you achieve creativity. Again, we're constrained. So I like uh, that uh, freedom. So maybe play is the best way. And uh, maybe, maybe we would just play 
and see what we can learn uh, from each other. So I, I love that about this uh, live show that I came here not knowing what you would ask me and uh, just playing with you, just playing with, with the audience, hopefully engaging with them after the questions and the follow up. So I think that's the, the value, I think, and the beauty. Brilliant. There is nothing I can add right now. So thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, and we will reconnect soon. Thank you so much, everyone uh, joining us today. To, just to remind you, we meet again next Wednesday and we'll probably talk education, sustainability, uh, because we have the York University Chair, uh, Charles Hopkins, as a special guest. Uh, one of the people I learned from a lot in terms of uh, think big and um, take care of the entire planet and not just people, but also everything around us. Thank you, Stephen. See you soon next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.